Tell me a fact and I'll learn. Tell me a truth and I'll believe. But tell me a story and it will live in my heart forever. The Names Not Numbers Oral History Film Documentary Project is remembering the stories of the Holocaust and is telling the story of the Holocaust for the world to hear, for the world to learn, and to inspire future generations to combat anti-Semitism and all forms of hatred and intolerance. This unique project is in its 16th year. Over 2,500 survivors and 6,000 students have participated in it worldwide. The students were instructed by teachers and professionals. They learned interviewing techniques from journalists. They learned filming techniques and editing skills from documentary filmmakers. The students interviewed, filmed, and edited the two-hour interviews with each survivor to make 20-minute oral histories that are compiled in the Names Not Numbers documentary at the school. You're about to view the documentary Names Not Numbers, a movie in the making. This film chronicles the students as they are being trained by the professionals and includes their reflections. In it is embedded approximately 10 minutes from each interview. This is the students' work. They're filmed and edited interviews. Through this project, our students are preserving history and they are the witnesses to the witnesses. I was about 10 years old. My mom took me to shul and a survivor was talking there. I couldn't comprehend that six million Jews could be killed like this. I grew up learning about the Holocaust and my family would always tell me about it. Six million people is a big number. Today we could have had so many more Jewish people, but because of the Holocaust, it, we don't. Feeling what someone's going through and understanding them. Walking in someone else's shoes, you feel it more and you care about it more. So that's how we're going to pass on the message, by feeling what they went through. It's important for people to empathize with each other so that you know that someone's there for you. I chose to do Names Not Numbers because I think it's so important to share all these survivors' stories. It would be like the worst thing if everyone was to forget. It could happen again and I feel like we just really need to spread awareness about what happened. Today we had the opening day of Names Not Numbers. This project is about interviewing those people who survived the Holocaust. We're going to be interviewing them to preserve their legacy and to pass on their story. You are the last generation to have the opportunity to meet live survivors. You have the opportunity to learn firsthand from those who went through the terrible Gehenna, the terrible hell of a Holocaust, of a Shoah to have the responsibility to carry that forward, to be the voice that stands up against those who try to say there was never a Holocaust, to have an opportunity to be part of, I would say it's more than just a program today. I would say it's a movement. It's a movement to make sure that we remain committed to learning about the Holocaust, teaching about the Holocaust, speaking up, and making sure people don't forget. Rabbi Menchel talked about the opening event and he said he went on a two-week program and he learned about the Holocaust and he learned all these things that a lot of people didn't know and as part of the Names Not Numbers I would hope to learn more things that I didn't know to try and see if I can help people understand more even if it's not it's not just for my benefit it's for many people's benefit. Adolf Eichmann was the force behind the final solution. 
He fled Europe. He went to Argentina with his wife, changed his name, started a whole new life. 1960, the Israelis kidnapped him and they brought him to Israel to stand trial for what had happened to the Jewish people in the Holocaust. The Germans kept everything. They were very proud of what they were doing. They had millions of pages of documentation. They were trying to document and show off to the world, especially for the future, that they had eradicated the Jewish people, and they were proud of this. And it's the prosecutor who brings 112 witnesses from all over the world to come tell their stories. And not only are they talking, but the world is listening. You are the very last generation that have this great kavod and opportunity to be able to sit across from the survivor and ask your questions, what you want to know. There were many reasons why these people didn't want to tell their stories at first. Now they are opening up and they are telling us their stories. Now that they're telling them to us, we want to help tell them to other people as well and try and get their stories spread out so that people know that the Holocaust happened and that it's not just a made-up story. We watched a documentary made by students. The doors open up and two high-ranking officers, a uh, Hungarian officer and an SS officer. Dr. Moshe Abital had been put through this horrifying experience of being in the Holocaust. He was separated from his family, his brothers and sisters, and you see how this person never really gave up hope. He can push through this and that there, w there is an end. There is like a way out of it. We walked around to the Auschwitz exhibit and we saw a lot of really fascinating artifacts from the Holocaust and before the Holocaust. Seeing what people wore was just like terrifying. It's just so painful to see that they had to wear and go through all this. On the second floor, I'm actually going to show you a scale model of part of your canal. I think that it was really fascinating to see all the artifacts and it was really interesting to see how life changed in the blink of an eye for them. Like they thought everything was fine, but it really wasn't. You're the new Jewish leadership of the Jewish people and we, the older generations, look to you to carry the banner of Yiddishkeit and Torah forward. Right? And it makes sense that you know what this is, you know what happened. We had a workshop with Dr. Paul Radinsky. Dr. Paul showed us pictures from the Holocaust and he asked us questions about it. Look at these, can you, can you guys see what these are? They're Jewish shops. So and that's the name of this game, okay? Um, Juden Raus, Jews out. I thought the picture of the board game was really interesting about how the Nazis made propaganda just to make them like hate Jews. Coming into the museum, I was really looking forward to learn about like the Holocaust. Coming out like of here with like the knowledge of all that stuff, I just think it's crazy that all that happened with still people who don't believe in it. Today we had an interviewing technique session. One thing that was especially interesting for me was that we got a person who writes a magazine to come to our school and talk to us from her perspective of interviewing to give us a little bit of facts on how to make a proper interview. How do we prepare for an interview? I know how to prepare when I'm having a guest coming to my house. I vacuum, clean the bathrooms, make a great meal, set the table. But how do I prepare for an interview? We learned like different ways of how to make the survivor comfortable during the interview, how to ask questions, what to ask them. What was Pesach like in town? What was Hanukkah like growing up? What was Shabbos like? What was Yom Kippur like? These give you a flavor of who the people is. Now remember, you only have 50 questions, um, so you have to limit it, but all these questions are amazing because they set the scene they also tell you about the interviewee. So you want the survivor to tell a story. She gave us specific questions that we can ask and not to say like yes or no questions and one to two word answers. A good interviewer speaks loud and clearly and understands who they're interviewing. I feel that what makes a good interviewer is that you can make eye contact with them because it makes them feel that you're really listening to their story. Today we were learning about how to operate the cameras, the audio, how to do the slate. Two cameras are going to be on the survivor, one's going to be on you guys, 
that's going to be that's going to be filming you, and you guys are going to operate that camera. We learned that we should use close up more for like very emotional parts of the interview because it just really helps the people that are watching the interview really feel what the survivor is talking about. One tip that I learned was that you should always check for bad audio because otherwise it will sound terrible and you can never fix audio. Well, let's say the interviewer is right here, so he would be on the right side. But let's say the interviewer is right here and he's looking over here. Which side? Then you would go on the other side. So we're going to turn him to here. We learned that you should use the rule of thirds because it just makes it the video look much nicer. So we had a workshop with the cameras and we learned how to use them properly. After I did all the group work, I, I wished I could do it again because it's really fun. Using these cameras made me feel like a pro. The filming class was really, really fun because it kind of felt like everything was coming together. It was right before our interviews and we were learning all about camera techniques and audio techniques and it really, really felt like the interview was right around the corner. Today I'm going to interview Rebettina Dessa Schneerson Karbach. I'm feeling kind of nervous that, you know, something sad's going to happen, it's going to touch me. Also, I'm eager to learn about her story and really understand what Holocaust survivors went through. I'm going to be interviewing Ruth Gruner. I'm really, really eager to hear everything that she has to say. I'm going to interview Annie Traring. I want to ask her how she stayed positive through this whole thing, because it must have been really rough. I hope to learn about how she coped with everything that happened in her life. I'm nervous that they're going to start crying, get emotional. I'm going to be interviewing Rosalie Simon. I'm going to interview Irving Roth. I'm feeling excited because I really want to learn more about his story. And I'm also a little bit nervous because I feel like I might mess up. I'm really excited. I'm also kind of nervous. I'm going to interview Elliot Zaretsky. I'm excited but also nervous to hear what he has to say. I'm nervous that I'm gonna mess up on the interview, say some like things that I shouldn't say because it's like, too painful for the survivor. My name is Sonia Mayer Geismar, 1935, in a small town in southwest Germany called Malsch. My name is Annie Trowering. February 7th, 1927, Antwerp, Belgium. My name is Elliot Zaretsky. I was born in 1931 or 35. I really don't know my true birth date. In a little village in Poland. Ruth Gruner, August 1st, in Lwów, that was the name of the city, Poland. My name is Irving Roth. I was born in a country that no longer exists. It's called Czechoslovakia, September 2, 1929. My name is Rosalie Simon. I was born July 25th, 1931. I was born in Czechoslovakia. My name is Hadassah Karlbach. I have many dates. The real one is 1927, Gutschwat, or Jan January 12th. But on my papers, there are different dates. I was born at that time, it's called, it was called Leningrad in Russia. No, it's called Petersburg. My family consisted of my parents and me. We had a very close relationship with my grandparents on both sides, as well as aunts and uncles and few cousins. My father had a tobacco supplies company, and my mother helped him in his business. My parents were observant, as was the rest of the family, and I'm sure I went to synagogue every Saturday, but I, I don't remember that. My mother was a housewife. My father was a lady's prime tailor. I have one brother, a younger brother. Jewish life in Antwerp was extremely, extremely pleasant. We had a very, very nice synagogue not far from home. I went to a public school at 8.30 in the morning, went home at 12 o'clock for lunch, went back to school at 2 o'clock, and then went home at 4. And then on Sunday, I went to Hebrew school. We used to go on outings on Sunday, and we used to play games, and uh, we used to walk. I had a very nice social life with, with lots of friends. We were six children, mother, father, and grandparents. 
I had three brothers and two and three sisters, and we had a fantastic relationship. My father was a butcher. He had a slaughterhouse. Also, he was dealing in woods, in forests, for production of paper goods. The family was religious, and they got along very well. They worked very hard. And we had a wonderful relationship with all of them. I really don't, didn't have much relationship with non-Jewish children because my whole relationship was with the children, with my own brothers and sisters. We were the only children in the village. I was an only child, but I had uncles, aunts, cousins. I went to kindergarten, a Jewish school that started to teach children of kindergarten age through high school. I had a few little friends from school. I went with my parents to synagogue and uh, celebrated holidays. I was the second child of a middle-class family, Jewish family, observant family, living in a small city, the eastern part of the country. My father, he had a lumber business. He produced railroad ties. The method of schooling was twofold. One was a public school, which every child attended, regardless of religion or ethnic group or whatever. And so all of us went to school to the same public school. In the afternoons, after we came home, we went to a Jewish school. We went six days a week. In my public school, we were friends with both Jews and non-Jews. We were a family of six children, five girls and one boy. My mother was a homemaker, and my father was dealing with the wholesale fruits, buying fruits in volume and selling them to different stores. We were not rich, but we were okay. We lived in a Jewish neighborhood, so I had lots of friends, and I was a very happy child. I didn't associate with any of the Gentile kids. I went to school. I loved school. We lived a pretty normal life. My mother let her rest in peace. She used to make a traditional Pesach. My favorite time was Passover because I got to eat from dishes that weren't used the whole year. And since I was a poor eater, I always liked to eat from a different utensil. My mother told me that she would borrow from a neighbor a plate and serve her food on the neighbor's plate. So I would think that it's going to be different or something, and I enjoyed that. Shabbos, we went to shul. I had a beautiful house with a garden, so we would sit in the garden in the afternoon. Shabbos was a, uh, we had a meal, and my mother was a fantastic cook, which she prepared the meals. Shabbos day, uh, my father used to make Kiddush. Every Saturday, every Shabbos, and my father sang uh, Zmiris, and we were all sitting at the table and having a very nice meal. I can remember just getting on top of the oven during the winters with all the kids on Shabbos to keep us, ourselves warm because we had no other heat. Going to synagogue, coming home and eating, maybe some singing after the meal. Us kids used to go out after that and play. All my sisters went out for a walk. It was a social thing. They got together with the friends, and so did I with my friends. Sometimes I sat home and I said to them. My parents have only two children. I, I was the first one, a long-awaited awaited baby because they didn't have any children for many years, and then they had me. And five years later, uh, my brother Schoenberg was born. My father was a secretary of the previous, previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzhak Schneerson. My father was 
was treated me almost as if I was a boy because he, he also learned with me and did, you know and felt that that I could understand just as well <laughs> as as a boy so he he pushed me a little harder than normal 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 girls at that age since I was born it was almost like war because I was under Stalin which was almost as dangerous as under Hitler. No one was permitted to, to leave Russia. As much as they don't, like, don't, they don't like us, for some reason, they also didn't give us permission to get out. You had to apply and apply and apply and being rejected and apply and apply. For us, it was, a very, it was very crucial to get out because my father was arrested many times for his ex activities. He was arrested 13 times. The only place that was a possibility to go to is when you said you want to go to Kever Avos to visit Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov, our Avos, in, a, in, a, in, a, in Palestine. We were given the per, uh, exit papers for me. It was Gan Eden. It was Gan Eden. It was a release. All of a sudden, it, it, it was okay. It was okay. It was okay to look happy. It was okay to to share things that the normal normal conversations and so on. So it was a, a wonderful, wonderful time. And then we came to France, 1936, and the war broke out in 1939. So I just had about. Normal three years in France. Once I was in class, and uh, one of the boys came up to the teacher, and he said, "Do you know what's going to happen to the Jews?" And the teacher said, "What? You know, they're all going to be killed." Since my parents were working, they had usually uh, girls, usually from the countryside, to take care of me. I was three years old. I must have done something to annoy the girl. Suddenly she started to scream, in Polish of course, you dirty Jew. I get to the school and the principal stands outside the gate and looks at kids as they come in and turns to me as I approach him and says, you can't go in because you're a Jew. I figured I didn't go to school, but at least I'm going to meet my friends and play soccer. Unfortunately for me, because I was thrown out of school and because the anti-Jewish laws began, the kids decided they really didn't want me on their team. I remember Kristallnacht. I will never forget Kristallnacht. There was a knock on the door, and in came a few Nazis who opened the drawers and threw the contents out, broke crystal and dishes, and then they went upstairs to the bedrooms and tore open the beautiful light green quilts and feathers were all over the place. My worst memory was that I saw a photo of my father that had been torn, and I thought that meant that he had died. My, my father and all the people in, who lived in our area were taken to Dachau. He was starved. He was treated very, very poorly. He was there for about five to six weeks. We wanted to go to Cuba. There was a ship that left Hamburg, May 13, 1939, and Cuba was going to be our haven until our quota numbers to the United States were called. I remember its wide staircases and chandeliers. There was a swimming pool, although I don't know if I ever went into it. And I saw people of color for the first time. 
So I asked my mother, you know, who are these people? And she said, oh, they're good people. They're not Nazis. We were turned away by, Cuba, by the Cuban government. All I know is that there were suitcases out in the hallways, and we couldn't disembark. I did not know the ins and outs of, of all of this, but I know that people were very, very upset. But my parents shielded me from all the, the difficulties of that. But people were very, uh, I mean, this was going to be their safe haven. And they, they were distraught, fearful. Where, where could we go? No country except the Dominican Republic was willing to accept uh, Jewish refugees. So where could we go other than to Germany, which was, which was a horror. Fortunately, that was averted. The courage and moral fortitude of Captain Gustav Schroeder who promised the passengers that he would not return us to Germany after we were turned away by Cuba, the United States, Canada, and other Latin American countries. The Joint put us up in a boarding house in Broadhurst Gardens, London, run by a Quaker family. All seven of us lived there. And in order to defray some of the expenses, my mother became the cook for the house. When we got to England, we were just biding our time. But we got to England in, at the end of June, 1939. September 1st, what happened? 1939. World War II started. Since we had German passports, we were, then caught, we were then deemed to be enemy aliens. I don't think anything happened to us, uh, but uh, my father was not allowed to work. May 10th, 1940, was a Friday. The Germans walked into uh, Belgium. We heard like, we thought it was thunder. It was actually bombing. We knew that we were being attacked. You know, we knew the Germans were coming, so we had to get out. And uh, my father and mother decided to pack, and we were leaving, and we left on that Sunday. We packed as little as we could because um, we couldn't take too much stuff with us, and it was very scary. We, we were all very scared. My parents were scared. I was scared. My brother was scared. And leaving the house was difficult, very difficult. We hired a cab. Everybody hired taxis because nobody basically had a car. And we went to the French port of uh, Calais. The Germans were bombing Calais. So we were trying to get into a house where we were safe. And we, we went just in that house. And then we knew that Calais was not going to work because the boats were not leaving because they were being bombed. So we went further south to Paris. And Paris, we had some friends. So we stayed in Paris for a while. And then when the Germans were occupying, you see there was, there was occupied France and there was unoccupied France. The Germans stopped at a certain point. So we decided to go to the unoccupied France. The town that I was was the Vidgoradoc. My parents took me there to see my grandparents. I was playing in the park and all of a sudden I see a German soldier on a, on a horse. He's chasing me. I walked up to my grandmother's house with blood all around me. I was unconscious for days. And this is when the first time I got to, uh, got to see the Germans. They told all the Jews to step out from their houses and line up in front of the houses. And they told us, be all in one line. And my grandmother was holding my hand. A command came in from the Germans. 
all the males over 13 years old, step one step forward. And my grandmother was holding on, you're not 13 years old. The last thing I heard, they laid them, lined them up in front of a grave and they shot them into the grave. Oh my, my grandfather, oh my uncles, they all got shot into the grave. My parents didn't know about it because this was a different town. My parents were in Sienkiewicz, then came about four o'clock in the afternoon and they told all the women, take whatever you can on you and line up in front of the house. My grandmother and my aunt with her children, they lined up in front of the house. They said, make a right, march. So we walked and walked and walked and came the night and we were in between two ravines. All the people couldn't walk fast enough and the German soldier shot them and kicked them in the, into the ravine. And I pulled my grandmother and we walked together so she would walk faster and they shouldn't shoot her. Shoot her. We were invaded first by the Russians. First, when they came in, everybody ran from the building into their cubicles in the cellar because uh, bombs were falling. And my mother said, hey, the war's another war. We have to run to the basement. And I was very scared. Every time I heard the thump, I was shaking. My father said to me, when you go to heaven, don't be scared because you have dolls that walk and talk. And I thought, what a wonderful idea because they didn't have such dolls. So then I'm not scared. It will be okay for me to die so I could have such beautiful dolls that walk and talk. Soon after, they entered. My parents heard rumors that there is going to be a deportation. We called it in Polish akcja, just for children. Since my parents heard about it, they planned how to hide me. In my town, there were about 2,000 Jews. 1,800 that a night, that particular night, on a Friday night, was taken from their home into the synagogue. Now imagine a space allocated for 500 people. Now you have 1,800. Locked up there for 36 hours with no bathrooms and no running water and no air conditioning in the middle of the summer. A day and a half later, they marched to the railroad station, put into cattle cars, gone. A small contingent of Jews, those still necessary for the economy of the city were left. My parents, my grandparents, my brother and I. That was in the summer of 1942. We knew we were in bad trouble. And so, uh, towards the end of 1943, we managed to get across the border into Hungary. The Hungarians came and they said, tomorrow morning we want you to be ready. It was the last day of Passover. It was my teacher that uh, searched us. We were going to be taken away. They didn't say where, but we were supposed to meet up on a farm, and we waited there until they checked everybody out, and then we got on the cat into the cattle cars, and they took us to an unknown place, but we wound up in, in Matisoko. There was no room for us to sleep. So we slept on the cemetery. We only had uh, the little bit of food that my mother brought from home. She also brought some beans and, and barley and something that she could cook up outside. And that's all we had. I went out for a walk once, just wandering around. And as I was walking, somebody stopped me and uh, took out a pair of scissors and cut all my hair off. And I fought and I cried, but he wouldn't stop. 
And at that time, no one's hair was cut off yet, not in the ghetto. So I sat on the tree and cried and cried. My mother found me and she said, Rosalie, don't cry. Your hair will grow back. We were so hungry. We didn't know what to do with ourselves. And I started to volunteer to uh, read storybooks that they brought from home to the little children, which made them forget a little bit about their hunger and it worked for me as well. We were in the ghetto uh, for about five, six weeks. It robbed me of my teen years. I had to become active. And, and in, ni in 1940, I was 13 years old. In 1941, I worked against the Germans. So at 14, I was a member of the resistance. February 11th, 1940, our Quota numbers were called, and all seven of us came to the United States. There were only 27,000 people per permitted to enter the United States from Germany at that time. And the waiting list was like 10 years long after Kristallnacht, which of course was an impossible situation. And those people, many of them perished. My father happens to be a Polish citizen. So the Polish army arrested my father and took him into the army. So we had, didn't have my father with me. It was just my mother, my brother, and I. We took to the train. And we were scared on the train because the Germans did come into the compartments, you know, because they were, that was already the occupied part. But uh, they never bothered my mother and, my, and, and the kids, so that was good. And we didn't know if we were going to see my father ever again. But thank God they released him because they lost the war, so they released him. So we all met in the south of France. It was like a miracle that we found each other and we really were crying and hugging. Very moving reunion, I must say. It was, we never thought we'd see him again. We never thought that. We lived in Nice. My father found work, which was very good. We lived there for two years. I went to school there. My brother went to school there. It was a very nice life. We had a nice apartment till 1942. The Germans took over the unoccupied part of France. The Jews were afraid. We were very, very much afraid. And um, my parents went into hiding. And they figured we would be OK in the apartment, my brother and I. But it wasn't the Germans who came for us. It was the French police. At 5 o'clock in the morning, they rang the bell. And uh, they asked where my parents were. We said we didn't know. And uh, so they said we should take a loaf of bread and prepare a couple of things that we want to take with us. And they took us to an assembly hall, my brother and I. At the assembly hall, you saw all people with all the luggages and everything, they were there. So I, being that I was like a little bit sure of myself, went over to the head of the department, the commissaire, actually, and I told him, we are Belgian citizens, my brother and I, which, by the way, we were not. We were basically Polish citizens from my parents' passport. But I lied, and I said, we're Belgian citizens, and my parents are not here, and you had no right to take us. And he said, you can go. If not for that guy, I wouldn't be here. My whole family wouldn't be here. It's like the guy did so much good not knowing what he did. So we went home. That night, my parents came out of hiding. And that night, we went over to Spain. We took a um, train to the border. Uh, it was Cerber, Porbou. Porbou was the French part. Cerber was the other part. And uh, we got off the, the train. And we got ourselves a smuggler, a Spanish guy, who used to say, justement, that was his French word, justement meaning exactly. And I remember calling him Justement because that's all he said. He took us across the border on foot. He smuggled us into Spain. 
There was a law in Spain that you had to be like two kilometers from the border, or maybe more than maybe 10 kilometers from the border. If you were caught within that time, that, and in that space, they would send you back to France. So we had to walk a long, long time to get away from that particular distance, and we went to Barcelona. We took the train to Barcelona. We went back to the Jewish, uh, whatever, society, and we introduced ourselves, and they, they introduced us to a very nice couple, and we became sort of like friendly with them. They were very nice. We were, we were put into an, a house where we were not legal because we couldn't register as um, residents, so we were legally in that house. We were very comfortable in that house, and uh, we were always afraid that the, the, the police would find us, but they didn't. From Spain, we took a train to Portugal. Trip was fine, we made it, we got to Lisbon, it was fine, everything was good. We came to a town that was called Lublin. We came to a park, and all the women that were tired and, and pregnant, they lay down on the grass. I could see them giving birth to children. And here the German soldier picks up one of the child that was just born, takes her by the leg, throws her up in the air, and with a bayonet called kills her and uh, takes the baby and puts it back into the arm of the mother, a dead baby. After that, we were walking. We wound up in a town called Stolen. And Stolen was a ghetto. It was surrounded by all wired fences and nobody could get out. We had nothing to eat. And my grandmother and her daughter-in-law with the children, they were starving from hunger. And I went from house to house in the ghetto and asking, get me a stick of bread. Give me a small piece of bread so I can help my, my grandmother. One day a woman came over, she said, somebody's looking for you. And here's a package of clothes, put them on, put those clothes on and make sure you crawl under this fence. And that's what I did. I crawled under the fence and on the other side, another former farmer lady was there. And she says, you come with me and I went with her, and not far away, my mother was waiting for me, and my mother brought me back to Sienkiewicz. I was there about not long, maybe a week, and another order came out. All the people from Sienkiewicz, take whatever you can, pack up, and you're going to another town. My father had a horse and buggy. He packed us up, and we came to Lachva. We had no place where to sleep. My father found, found a place in somebody's house in the attic. The next six months, I think, we spent in the ghetto eating potatoes with water. They took my father to work on the railroad tracks, which was a lucky thing. He met a lot of the people that he used to do business with. He used to buy from them the forests and they helped him out. They brought him some bread, and they brought him some butter, that my father used to hide the butter in the toes of his shoes. One day they found the butter in his toes, and they beat him up so badly he couldn't walk. Later on, they had the liquidation of Lachwa. My father took us to the other side of the camp. The shooting started. I stepped on the wire, and I cut my foot, okay? A woman came over to me, and she says, there's no medication, there's nothing, but you can do one thing. She said, urinate on my foot. I should urinate on my foot, that's the only thing that's going to help it. They were pushing, pushing, and all of a sudden, my, this fellow jumped the German soldier, chopped him over the head with a hacksaw. Okay, that's, and then I found out later on, there were about five or seven of the young men that got together and they didn't tell anybody that they were going to do an uprising. And what happened, they started pushing, and I was pushed out of the camp. Well, when we came to Hungary, we had some relatives in a small village. So my grandfather and grandmother, my brother and I, wound up in this small village. My parents went off to Budapest, to the capital, because my father needed a job. The ghetto was a brick factory. It was surrounded by a fence with guards outside and you couldn't leave. We were not in the ghetto for a very long time, just maybe a week or two. We gathered around, uh, they took us to a train, 
Again, we went into the cattle cars, and uh, they counted 80 people to one car. I happened to be the 81st person, and I was shoved into another car. We didn't know where we were going. We were all loaded into cattle cars. In the cattle car was my brother and I, my grandparents, cousins, uncles, and another 85, 90 people. Without any food, without anything, there was a, a bucket in the corner, and that's where you had to go if you needed to go to the bathroom. In front of everybody, it was awful. It was crowded, it was uncomfortable, it smelled. I remember the, the whistle blowing of the engine and the, the, the railroad tracks and the noise. I still, I still remember that. And the train stops, the doors are slid open, and the first thing I see is guards. We didn't know where we were. We saw Arbeit macht frei. The screaming started. They opened the door. Get out, in German. Heraus, mach schnell, go quickly and take nothing with you. But we did see the flames coming out of the uh, chimneys. My cousin standing next to me asked me, what do you think these factories are making? My answer was, they're gonna make soap out of us. And if I become a bar of soap, I'll refuse to bubble. I thought I was being funny. Police were standing there and a lot of uh, inmates were helping. One of them asked me, how old are you? And I said, 12. He said, when somebody asks you how old you are, tell them you're 16. I'm facing a man in uniform who looks at me and points his riding crop one way. My grandfather, grandmother, most of the young people, my cousin who is 10 years old, her mother holding her hand are marched off in one direction my brother and I in the other direction, and we're called by name to sit on a chair. Next to the chair is a small table. On the other side is another chair. And the man on the other side is wearing a uniform, a striped blue, a gray and blue jacket, pants and hat, and tells me to roll up my sleeve, which I do. He takes something which looks like a hypodermic needle and begins to poke my arm. And as I look at it, there's a number appears. The number is A10,491. I was sent with my mother to the left. As I was walking with my mother, I heard on the loudspeaker that uh, those who are going to the left are going to receive more bread. So I wanted to get my sisters. I was always very close with my sisters. I left my mother, I turned around and went to get my sisters. I saw them, but we were surrounded by the SS guards and were not able to turn back. I never saw my mother again. I was devastated for leaving her, but I thought that we'll come back soon and we'll all be together. I didn't know that I would never see her again. After getting the numbers, marched about two miles away to another camp of Auschwitz called Auschwitz I, which was a slave labor camp. And there we had triple-decker beds. They basically, they were boards. There were three tiers of beds. We were about 12 people in one bed. Nobody could turn around because if one turns, the rest of the people had to turn. The barracks consist of nothing but shelves. Oh, cup five o'clock in the morning, we were standing tail appel. They counted us every single day, morning and night. They gave us a little bit of black coffee. Black liquid, referred to as coffee. It was something called ersatz, or it wasn't real coffee. At noon, you would get some soup. That was terrible. And for dinner, we got a little potato, a little rotten potato. And at night, you get some bread. That was the diet of Auschwitz. Most of the day, we were sitting outside of the barrack because they wouldn't let us in. 
and it was so hot my lips were blistered from the hot sun. I said to myself, if I ever get out of this hell, all I wish for in my life is to have enough potatoes and I'll be happy. That's all I wished for. Henry was an eight-year-old boy who my parents had to take in when the Russians entered our city because the communists felt that our apartment was too large for three people. My father took off the door from the larger bathroom, put a sliding door closet, and made the back wall of the closet also slide. So when the day came for this deportation for children, Henry and I crawled in to the bathroom. And my mother gave me a little bag with bread and water. I thought, oh, she's giving me something to eat. If they find me, I shouldn't die hungry. We were sitting very quietly, and suddenly we saw the shine of a flashlight. I remember the feeling I had that I couldn't breathe all of a sudden, and I heard footsteps in the apartment going in and out. After a long while, my father opened the door from the closet and told us he left. All the children who were collected on that day were placed into trucks. The trucks were covered with, uh, what kind of cover, I don't know, and gas was inserted. And then they came up with the idea that we had to move into the ghetto. My father and the neighbor decided as soon as we moved into the ghetto to find a hiding place for us when an axia will come. So they dug a hole and back they opened the wall from the barn and dug a hole underground. And there was in the barn the bottom of a bedroom dresser, made the back wall of the dresser slide. When we heard rumors that there will be an axia, we ran to the barn and jumped into that hole. One day, my father had a job outside of the ghetto. And one day when he came back from work, he told me and my mother that he met in the street Mrs. Chigil, and she said, I assume you, your wife, your child will be killed. But I want to save the life of your daughter. Tomorrow when you go to work, bring her with you and I will come and pick her up. The next day, my mother dressed me in dark clothing. My father told me to put my feet on his feet, and he put on a long winter coat to cover me. We came to his place of work. He said, Mrs. Chigio will come to pick you up at three o'clock. And the time came, she didn't come. She changed her mind. She realized that if I would be found in her home, she, her husband, her mother who lived with them, and three girls, daughters, they would all be killed. Since she knew that I will definitely be killed walking back into the ghetto, she will come but the next day. And all the lights were turned off and it was dark and it was freezing and I fell asleep crying. And the next day, she did come and she took me. It was painful not to be with my parents anymore. My father had organized a, a home for, for children and some of their parents and, and the biggest staff. And we had to usually go during those years we did not stay in one place. We went from place to place. Later on, I was already in charge of my own group. That means being someplace isolated, high in the mountains, providing for the, the, the teaching them and, and with the help of another girl, cooking for them and, and for little kids. And sometimes we had to leave in the middle of the night and change places because our it was blown the place. Somebody betrayed us. We knew that it's gonna, we were afraid of a raid. 
when messages have to be given from one group to another. I was helping with getting kids to a doctor, find out which doctor is not collaborating, which doctor is going to help because kids did get sick and we had to get medicine for them. At one point I learned some medicine, how to treat impetigo, it's a skin, a skin problem, or another one where kids used to get boils because they were undernourished, so they would get skin infections. I did a lot of very different things during the war. I had to keep a strict pro program every day to keep up the morale of the kids. I had to make sure that they get, get up, brush their teeth, and do a little davening with them. Where there wasn't much of a breakfast, but of course we, we, we had that. And then we worried what we're going to serve for lunch, that's another story. And then I had, to, I had, I had a group from, from 4 to 10. I had to, to teach them somehow that fit in for everybody at their speed, whatever, whatever they are, at Chumash. I didn't do much secular teaching except uh, some reading and math, a little arithmetic. In order to accommodate such a large group, we had to have a, 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 large, a large chateau, a, cas a castle. So that started first in the Vichy area. But then Jews could not stay, remain in the Vichy area anymore. And the center of the, is all the Jewish operation with the help from the joint was in the south of France, in Marseille. So we had to move the whole, this, uh, ourselves to Marseille. The Americans had sent social workers over to Europe to, to get the children out of Europe. It was called the Children's Refugee Service. So my father, being afraid that the Germans were going to invade Spain and Portugal, decided that since I was a 13-year-old, he thought I should go with that Children's Refugee Service to the United States. I wasn't very happy about it because my brother wasn't going to go with me. I was going to go by myself. But I couldn't say no because my father was very insistent. My parents stayed in Portugal with my brother. We wound up in the partisan the underground army where they made me and my sister do blowing up the trains. The captain came in from the group and he said to us, well, we don't need any children. My father says, I'm not getting rid of my children. I'm going to take my children with me and we'll split up. So he took us and we were split up. Then we got joined by other Jewish survivors in the forest. For two and a half years, we were in the swamps. We lived in a teepee. It was made out of branches of a tree and with a fire in the middle of the teepee. And we all laid around that during the winter to keep ourselves warm. We made shoes out of straw and rags and living on whatever we can find in the forest. I came to Auschwitz in around May of 1944. And by January of 1945, the Russian army was getting close. And so the decision by the uh, Nazis was to evacuate anybody who can march. I believe it was the 17th or 18th of January. The 60,000 people still alive were marched out of Auschwitz and thus begin the death march. So it was cold. You're talking January in Poland. We are dressed in just a jacket and pants and a hat. So you're cold. And you're tired because continue walking, marching, at a pace they set, you're tired. We finally uh, came to a place called Gleiwitz, which is a major humping yard where you make up trains. And they put that into those cars, under guard, of course, and the train begins to move an hour, two hours, three hours. And finally, the train stops. They tell us to get out, and under guard, we marched into a new place. And the place was called Buchenwald, which was a concentration camp. 
the conditions in Buchol were much more difficult. The food rations were much less than in Auschwitz, if you can imagine that. One day, my brother was taken away. There was no one, really, who I knew from home. I was put into a particular barracks, were mostly children. The blockhead, that's the, the man who was in charge of us, tried to the extent possible to shield us and protect us. One night he says, I don't want you to go to sleep. I want you to sit up. And in walks a friend of his and he introduces him. This friend is a, in his civilian life, his real life, was a math teacher. And in Buchenwald, to this maybe 100, 150 kids sitting around, he gave a lesson in geometry. Seems like a bizarre idea. You're hungry, you're oppressed, you don't know where you're going to live another day. To have a lesson in geometry, it doesn't make any sense. All of us kids were transported emotionally, to a different place, to a place in the classroom. And so it was a form of respite and relief. Later on, I found out who Mengele is when he chose me again to go to the gas chamber. I was small and skinny, and he didn't believe that I was 16. So he motioned to one of his aides to lock me up in the in a room. And that's when I knew that this is going to be my last day on this earth. My sisters left me, although they did go and ask Dr. Mengele, please let my sister come with us. We're five sisters. He said to her, and how dare you talk to me? We were nothing. We were like a, a bug to to step on, you go with her if you want to be with her. Meaning, she can go to the gas chamber. They all can go to the gas chamber. But they left, and I got hysterical. I cried and knocked on the window and begged, please, somebody, let me out. I want to live. It was like the walls were on fire and I'm trying to save my life. And no matter how much I cried and knocked on the window, nobody heard me. There was a mother and a daughter. He chose the daughter to go to the gas chamber. The mother passed, but the daughter didn't. So the mother volunteered to go with her child to the gas chamber and die together. A woman that helped Dr. Mengele, she opened the door to take the mother and the daughter in. And as a result of having an extra person in that room, she was able to let one person out. And she chose me, gave me clothes, and told me, run. I was just running. I didn't know where. I didn't even want to stop to put my clothes on. I was running naked, and I heard someone calling my name. Rosalie, come here. I had no place to stand because they were all five in a row already. And the fifth person was afraid to move. But they explained it to her that I was chosen to die, and I, and I need a place to stand to please move to another row. She finally agreed. They needed workers for uh, an ammunition factory. Our whole barrack, I think about 900 people, were put on the train. We didn't know where we were going. They took us to a town called Geislingensteige. It was better than Auschwitz. I didn't see the ovens. I didn't see the, the gas chambers I had a very nice person as a boss. And he made fun of the, of the Nazis. What do they want from you? Why are you here? 
And he used to bring me sometimes bread. And he used to say, Rosita, nobody ever called me by my name. Put your head down for a few minutes. Close your eyes. And he was standing and watching out for the assess. Because if they would catch me, it would be bad. We were there for um, seven or eight months working until they realized that they're losing the war. So again, we were taken to the cattle cars and taken to another camp called Alach Dachau. And what we saw, I will never forget. Piles and piles of dead bodies. Because we really didn't get any food there. We didn't have beds. We didn't, we slept on the ground. It was cold. When I came into the Stigio apartment, I was taken to the back bedroom of the house. My hiding place in their apartment was under the bed. I stayed there for eight months. My grandma took care of me. She brought me food because they didn't have much. The youngest daughter got sick and she wanted her boyfriend to visit her and I have to be under the bed. They had a little dog. He tried to pull me out, and he was with his mouth, you know, pulling at my dress. Since that moment, I guess, Hashem is watching over me. She said to him, hey, why don't you go to the window and see how the weather is? I hope it stopped raining so I can go out tomorrow. He got up immediately, went to the window, her mother opened the door to the bedroom and the dog ran out. You never know if he would have wanted to collect a reward from the Germans, he would have reported the family that they're hiding, most probably a Jewish child, because why else would a little girl be hidden? She got so scared by this experience that she kept begging her parents to get rid of me. One day she said, I am going to take you to visit your parents. It wasn't a visit. She was probably hoping that maybe the Oyex will want to accept me. She was desperate. She didn't know what to do with me. I forgot how to walk downstairs because I wasn't outside in you know, such a long time. Emma gave me walking lessons. If a neighbor, somebody's in the hallway, and they'll see me walking in a funny way. People become suspicious. So I looked, picked up my head, and I saw a blue sky. Stigio rang the doorbell, and Mrs. Oyak opened the door. I always said like, to myself, hey, the world is so beautiful. I would so much like to live. Mr. Oyak was standing next to her, and Mr. Oyak said, let her stay. It's the same death for us, whether we are hiding one, two, or three people. A lot of the children went to Switzerland and with their, that were smuggled. I had to help prepare them for, for crossing the border. Most of them we managed to get over to Switzerland. And my, my family just remained, and then we were hiding just the last few months of the war. It was just my, my parents, my, myself, my brother. We were uh, at the top of that mount, mountain near the Swiss border, and uh, we didn't even know exactly what's happening, but we did hear some farmers had illegal radios. You were not permitted to have a radio in the house, but some farmers did and they listened to the uh, British broadcast. Somehow they got, they got the, the news. And that's how we found out that they landed. We were not yet liberated, but we knew already that they landed, and we could follow their progress. I feel I can't believe it that the nightmare is over. 
still couldn't believe it. We were liberated by the Russians. We looked out and there were no guards. And next thing we knew, American soldiers were approaching our barracks. It was almost as if a yoke was lifted off my back. Saying nobody wants to kill me anymore. Hey, I'm alive. I'm gonna reach my 16th birthday. Couldn't believe it, I started to cry. How can this be, we're free. I was so relieved and happy. We heard shooting and fighting in the street. The Russians entered, chased out the Germans. Oh my God, I, I remember I was nearly run over by a car because I ran into the street. It was exuberant. When the war ended in Europe, we were very, very thrilled because we knew the people in, in Europe were free again. So we were very, very happy. The Americans took care of us. They took us to a place where we had beds and sheets and uh, blankets and food. After a couple weeks there, they told us, you can go anywhere you want. We decided to go back to Prague. The train stopped in Prague and somebody approached us. She said, do you know that your father is alive and he's in the hospital in Prague? So we immediately got off the train and went to see my father in the hospital. He was skin and bone. I was so happy that he's alive. I was so thankful. Two of my sisters stayed with him and three of us proceeded to go home. The streets were empty in our neighborhood. The houses were empty. Uh, my house was uh, demolished inside. They were looking for money or whatever. It was uh, a place for horses. They put horses there. I went back to the, to the village, found my parents. We went back to our town, which is now Czechoslovakia again. But someone lives in our house. So we took the house and split it in half. This non-Jewish family lived in half of it, and we lived in the other half. But we weren't really welcome. Comments like, Nazi Germany and Adolf Hitler did not do a particularly great job. Look how many Jews survived. And already then, they came back. They want back their businesses. They want back their homes. Anti-Semitism and the hatred of the Jew did not stop. The Russians came out with their notice. All Polish people should go to Poland. We packed up and we moved to Poland. When we got to Poland, I got separated from my sister and from my father. And I wound up in a home for the orphans. And I lived there for about a year, year and a half. All of a sudden we were being trying to go to Israel. I feel something, somebody's behind me. I turn around and who is that? My father, my father, fathers. I was supposed to go to Israel. My sister was supposed to go to Israel. But my father says, come with me. We'll be here. We'll go to the United States for two months. And then after two months, we'll go to Israel. We agreed to it. We were liberated by the Russians in 1944. And the war ended in 1945. Mr. Oyek said, you know, it's not safe here. The Germans may come back yet because the fighting. Wait, wait a few days. My father said, we have to get out of here. We have to go to Poland, where Poland is not under Russian, only Polish government, which was Kraków. By that time, a Jewish organization he said they will organize a trip for us to go to Poland. And when we came to Krakow, uh, the organization gave us a room. They had uh, occupied the whole building. They had their office in the building. They started school in the building because we were a few kids, but all different ages. 
in one classroom. So we had to sit together and each, the teachers had to go to each one to give them a private few minutes. We went back to Paris, not all of us. As my father reopened his office. We re-rented that chateau that we were in, this, in the same area. There were people in the neighborhood that needed a place to congregate that they didn't know where to go. There were a lot of people that we didn't know were hiding even in that area. We uh, lived with my aunt's parents-in-law. We lived in the Bronx, and I was just happy to be away from Germany and off a ship, and I started school. By the time I was in the third grade, I started out in kindergarten, because I was five when I came here. I, I think I was pretty well uh, acclimated. I guess I was like in third or fourth grade. I had to explain to friends I was Jewish and German. They couldn't understand the dichotomy between the two. I said, look, Jewish is my religion. I was born in Germany, but I'm not a Nazi. I had an aunt living in Brighton Beach, and I could have gone to her house, but the Children's Refugee Service was very strict about not having somebody out of the house when I was there. My aunt was a working woman, so she left the house early in the morning and came home late in the evening, so I couldn't stay in her house. My uncle had a cousin living in Detroit, Michigan, who was a very wealthy man, so they decided, my uncle and the refugee service decided that since I couldn't stay with them, I should go to at least a family, not just to a stranger house, so I went to Detroit to stay with that family. And I stayed with them for six months. I was very lucky because I spoke English, so that was good. And after six months, my parents came to the United States and I came to join them in New York. We came on a boat from Sweden. We arrived in New York waters in the harbor and seeing lights and seeing things moving with lights. We actually were looking at the Belt Parkway <laughs> and very uh, anxious uh, to see what, what is this place. We were very excited, you know, we were standing at the front of the ship and we were like screaming, we were so happy to be here. Arriving to America was a happy feeling. The mayor of the city came to welcome us. He had an orchestra and they played for us. And he had a speech, but most people didn't understand the speech anyway. But it was a nice feeling to be welcomed and to be greeted. Today, um, Rabbi Michelle gave a program about Amuna. When you look at the Holocaust, the Holocaust sort of goes beyond anyone, any, any one of us being able to comprehend, right? Even if you've heard from survivors, you're hearing an eyewitness account, but it's not something we can fully, fully understand or relate to. Acts of Emuna that took place in the ghettos, that took place quietly, people lighting Shabbos candles. They had to make things out of, you know, they, they rubbed stones together to make a fire and burn something. They called that a candle. They were holding on to as much as they could. People who studied Torah, people who educated their children, things that were against the rules. They held on, they clung to their faith. When we sit here today and we're meeting survivors, many of whom have maintained their faith and built families who are also observant and deeply faith-driven. Faith These are holy people. You know that, right? Everyone that went through the Holocaust whether they kept their faith or not, if they didn't make it through the Holocaust, they died, it was clearly al Kiddush Hashem. Because the only reason they were killed was because they were Jewish. And people who survived and rebuilt Judaism 
rebuild communities, we have to be inspired by those people. We have to be in awe of those people. It was really nice and inspiring. I learned that you should never give up and that you should always believe that Hashem will fix everything. If you believe and you really try, you could get through anything that life throws at you. We are all God's children, created by Him. No matter what color of skin, what nationality, what religion, what country we are born in, people have to be good to one another. Help yourself and Hashem will help you. By speaking up, you're helping yourself, you're helping all of Tal Yisrael. Whenever you see something is wrong, speak up, try to do something about it. To be upstanders, never to be a bystander when you see someone doing injustice to another person. Be aware what's going on around you. Watch out for anti-Semitism because it's growing. Israel should be strong. Never to forget. Don't be a bystander. It's incredible that people still can deny that something existed when all the evidence and facts are there to support the existence of that. My hope, you guys, you guys are giving me hope that this is not forgotten. Give hope that you support Israel. Give hope that you fight for your rights. Give hope that you fight anti-Semitism. Stay, stick together. Support each other. Don't forget Israel. Remember, the Chorvalo Tishkach. Because if you don't remember, and you don't tell your children about it, then your grandchildren and great-grandchildren, they never existed. And that would be a crime. To recognize the signposts along the road to hatred of the Jewish people and do something about it. We need to stand up for ourselves and stay true to ourselves. We should always just have faith and be happy with what we have. I learned that you should always be with people, no matter what the situation. Never stop fighting for what you believe. My message is for everyone to share the story and believe and everyone to stick together. You should never forget it because you don't want it to ever happen again. Never forget. If we forget, the Holocaust could possibly happen again because history repeats itself, so we want to never forget. If we forget this Holocaust, it will happen again. Silence can really, really hurt people. The Holocaust was terrible, but being quiet about it and not making sure that everybody is aware, that's even worse. This was a terrible thing. They say that history repeats itself, but I hope that this will never happen again. And to think about it, how many Jews and children and people died. The number six million is a huge number. It's a terrible thing.